Welcome to another learner video for Unit 2. This is on Curia 4B, which looks at the analysis of patterns of inheritance for genetic screening. There's a number of things that we should be able to do. This includes draw, analyse and interpret family histories over three generations to follow patterns of inheritance in various types of genetic disorders. Before you continue, it's worth actually going back to National 5 level genetic crosses and just having a practice drawing out Punnett squares to look at for phenotypic ratios for these following crosses based on these different phenotypes up here. So for this particular cross, you would use the Punnett square to add in the possible gametes of the male and the female. And then if these two gametes met, you would end up with these different possible phenotypic ratios of, or different phenotypes in the different offspring. So here you would have three dominant to one recessive phenotype in your gametes. You do your crosses, so big R, little r, big R, little r, little r, little r, and little r, little r. So you end up with a one to one ratio of the dominant to the recessive phenotype. And again, for the last one, you end up with all of them 100% with the dominant phenotype. OK, so that's just a basic background on basically national five level. And sometimes this type of thing does still come up at higher level. However, the majority of it is looking at pedigree charts and trying to work out genotypes within that using phenotypic information. So, for example, we'll become more familiar with these things called a pedigree chart. And this is over three generations. So grandparents, parents, children. So there's some basic things that we need to be aware of. Males are always squares. Females are always circles. When we're looking at a pedigree chart, it's always going to track one particular condition. Say it's a condition, the Black shaded in boxes will always be that the person has that condition, whereas the open shapes will be the person is unaffected. Okay. Diagonal lines, you don't tend to see this so much in exams, but just in case, this would mean that that person had died. This is a marriage line here, so it shows that this man is married. To, well, it's, I guess it's a reproduction line. So this male and female have. Um, had children together and this is line of descent so they've had one boy, two boy, three boys and one daughter okay and they in turn have um, got together with somebody else and had two boys and a girl okay so it's typically called a marriage line and then this is your line of descent so first generation, second generation third generation. The reason for looking at something like this, it's almost worth thinking back to when we looked at fertility issues and we thought about IVF and the idea of pairing in vitro fertility treatments with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So why were we doing that? That was so that we could um, select the best embryo, the healthiest embryo for implantation. So here we're looking at how we can use phenotypic information to maybe make predictions about if this person, this person had a child, what would be the probability of them having a child who carried potentially a life limiting condition. So they're really, really powerful things to be able to inform potential parents of um, what could happen if they were to go on to have a child. So there are different patterns of inheritance that we need to know at higher level. Autosomal recessive, autosomal dominant. So in both these cases, the condition that we're interested in is carried on one of the 22 autosomes. Autosomal incomplete dominance, where one particular phenotype is not fully dominant over the other. And then sex linked recessive traits, where the condition is actually um, controlled by a gene found on either on the sex chromosomes themselves. 
So X and Y chromosomes are the sex chromosomes and all other chromosomes are known as autosomes. So let's first of all look at the pattern of inheritance in an autosomal recessive condition. So this would be a typical pedigree here and we're going to look at cystic fibrosis. Okay. The trait is expressed relatively rarely because it is recessive. It can skip generations. Males and females are equally affected and all sufferers, because it's recessive, will have to have two copies of that recessive allele, so they will be homozygous recessive. Non-sufferers, however, we would have to start working it out because they could be heterozygous or homozygous dominant. So whenever I'm trying to work these things out, so you've got their phenotype, you know this person has got cystic fibrosis and this one doesn't, you want to start trying to assign genotypes to all of the individuals. So here we know it's autosomal recessive. So if they have cystic fibrosis, they can only be little e, little e, for example. If they are unaffected, they could be either of these genotypes. So we start to assign those genotypes. So anyone who's affected becomes little e, little e. And then we start to piece it together. So some we don't know, but this person here has got one copy of the gene from their mum. And that mum there could only give the little e. So the dad must have given a big e to allow that person to be unaffected. And that's the same for all of the offspring here. So they all got a little e from mum, must have got the dominant allele from dad. Okay, so now we move on to the next group here. So we can backtrack from here. Similarly, this male here must have got one recessive allele from dad and one recessive allele from mum. So we can start to work those out. They both must have recessive allele to have produce this child, but they're unaffected, so they must have also a dominant allele. Another style of question that you might be asked relates to these kind of things here, where you've got the parental genotype and you might be asked, what's the probability of these parents having a child with cystic fibrosis? So you complete a quick Punnett square and you'll find out that because this person can only give a dominant allele and this is recessive, then all the children will have one of each and they will be heterozygous and therefore they might carry the ability to pass on that uh, recessive allele but the chance of them actually having the condition is zero percent. This one here says there is an autosomal blood disorder in which a faulty form of haemoglobin is produced. The, hemo the allele for the normal haemoglobin is dominant to the allele for faulty haemoglobin. What is the genotype of person one in the first generation? So they are affected male, so they must be little h, little h. And then person four in the second generation, they have, with person three, produced a child who is affected. So they must have a faulty allele to have given, but they must also have a healthy allele because they don't have the condition. So they must be big H, little h. The second type of inheritance pattern we need to be aware of is autosomal dominant. So this sort of now flips round and here the condition is passed on with a dominant allele. So a person is only unaffected by a condition if they have now got two recessive alleles. So with this type, males and females again, because it's autosomal, are equally affected. All non-sufferers must be homozygous recessive. Sufferers can be homozygous dominant or heterozygous, so you can see that it's going to be much more um, prevalent in a family. Again, assign genotypes to as many phenotypes as you can, and you, I always start with the key and say, well, in this particular case, someone who is affected can be either these genotypes, and if they do not have the condition, they're unaffected, they will have two recessive alleles. So I start plugging that information in. So this person here, we know is heterozygous because they must have got the recessive allele from mum. However, they also have the condition. So the dad must have given a dominant allele. 
However, we cannot work out from this one person what the father is. We'll look here at a quick Punnett square. What's the probability of these parents having a child with Huntington's? Do a quick Punnett square and you work out to one to one, so a 50% chance. So our third type is incomplete dominance with an autosomal condition. So this is quite unusual. So this is where you might have, let's stick, let's go with flowers for now. We've got a red plant and we've got, this is dominant. And then we've got a white plant, which is also kind of dominant because neither one is more dominant over the other. And because of that, we use different letters for the different phenotypes. And when we do the crosses, we get a big R from this plant because it's all it can give and we get a big W from this one. And because of that, we end up with this heterozygous genotype, which means we get a different phenotype from either parent. And in this case, we get a pink plant. So here, in some cases, the dominant allele does not fully express itself. This is known as incomplete dominance. And when writing that out, both alleles have capital letters and a different letter. So here, if we had a red plant and a white plant, we do our Punnett square, same as always, we end up with this heterozygous combination where we actually have a completely different phenotype. So this actually does happen and in a condition known as sickle cell. So you can get three possible outcomes in this, in this condition, completely unaffected, sickle cell trait and sickle cell anemia. Okay, in sickle cell disease, we have these crescent shaped red blood cells, which don't carry nearly as much oxygen as a healthy, normal red blood cell. People who are homozygous for abnormal allele are given the genotype Big S Big S and suffer from this condition known as sickle cell anemia. Those who are homozygous for the normal allele are big H, big H and produce normal, healthy haemoglobin. And those who are heterozygous end up with this condition, slightly milder condition known as sickle cell trait. And they've got the genotype big H, big S. You can see anyone with sickle cell trait is going to have the heterozygous genotype. Anyone who is unaffected will have the two healthy alleles and anyone with sickle cell disease, this person here, we filled them all in, will have the two um, affected alleles here. Finally, we come on to our fourth pattern of inheritance, which is associated with any condition that's passed on via the sex chromosomes. If we look at sex chromosomes, we've got the smaller Y chromosome in a male and this larger X chromosome. And these are sex-linked genes here. Genes which are carried on the same sex chromosome are said to be sex-linked. So we use X and Y to represent the sex chromosomes and we will superscript the letters to represent the alleles. So whereas previously we would have gone big R, little r, now we're going to say, well, on the X, first X chromosome in this female, she's carrying a dominant allele. And on her second X chromosome, she's got the recessive allele. So a typical, uh, an example of a sex-linked recessive trait would be colour blindness. So here we could have a male who is colour blind. The allele is always carried on the X chromosome only. And we have got a female who has colour vision. So two healthy alleles. She's a non-carrier. So we can do a basic Punnett square. So this would be the two sperm cells that are produced. This one will carry the recessive allele. This one's the healthy Y. And then the female one egg would have the dominant allele and so would the other. So you can start to do a Punnett square here and see the possible outcomes. Okay, and the outcome of that is that you have got a female with normal vision, but carries it, a second female who is a carrier, and two unaffected males. Crucially, sons get the Y from their dad. Therefore, if they end up with a condition, they have got that due to inheriting it from their mother. Daughters have to get the recessive allele from both parents 
to inherit the condition and therefore you tend to find more males affected by sex linked conditions. So key characteristics to look out for, many more males are affected than females. None of the sons of an affected male will show the trait because the affected male would only pass on the Y. Look, we've got an affected father, unaffected mother. So for all boys, this man here will pass on the Y. Okay. Therefore, the boys will be completely unaffected in this family because their mother only passes on healthy alleles. However, the dad can pass on his and will pass on his affected allele to both his daughters, but because the mum only has healthy alleles, both daughters are carriers and could eventually pass that on. So let's have a look at a particular example here. So for female sufferers, so anyone who is, is affected by the condition for females, they're going to have two recessive alleles. And for males, they will have one recessive allele. Non-affected non or unaffected females can be homozygous dominant or heterozygous. And a non-sufferer male must carry the dominant allele. So you can start plugging these genotypes into your cross. So let's have a look at a couple of past paper questions that you might encounter. So the first one here, the table below shows some genotypes and phenotypes associated with forms of sickle cell anemia. So this one here is showing three possible phenotypes. So we know that this must be incomplete dominance. A woman with sickle cell trait, so this one here, and an unaffected man have a child together. What are the chances of the child having sickle cell anemia? So you do a quick Punnett square and you find out that you've got two unaffected and two sickle cell trait. So you have got no chance at all of those two people having a child with sickle cell anemia. Another one here, the inheritance of an allele for deafness is shown in the family tree below. This is a really common style question where based on the, the pedigree chart shown, you've got to work out what the condition is. Now, a key thing to look out for here is if you have got two unaffected parents having children that have the condition, this is a classic example of autosomal recessive. Start exploring different options here. So let's say it was autosomal recessive. For the unaffected female, this would be the possible genotypes. Unaffected male, unaffected or unaffected male or female, both would be this. So you start to plug them in. These three here are going to be little e, little e, and therefore both parents must be that. And so the whole pedigree makes sense and works out. And therefore, as a consequence, we know the answer here must be D. It is recessive and not sex linked. Okay, another example here. Muscular dystrophy is an inherited condition in which muscle fibres gradually degenerate. The condition is sex linked and caused by a recessive allele. So one of the four types that we need to know about. The family tree below shows the inheritance of the condition through three generations. And we need to use the letter D to represent the alleles and state the genotype of individual R. So this person is a carrier female, so it's a particularly straightforward example. Carrier, so big D, little d. Because it's sex linked, we need to make sure that we are adding that information onto the sex chromosomes. So one X is going to carry the dominant allele, one X will carry the